Welcome. We're so happy to see you filtering in. Welcome, welcome. I think we will go ahead and begin this evening's program. Okay. Oh, how wonderful to see you all joining us this evening. Um, welcome to our National Poetry Month installation of the Emily Dickinson Museum's new reading series, uh, Phosphorescence. Dickinson said, now there's a word to lift your hat to, to find that phosphorescence, that light within, that's the genius behind poetry. So this series of virtual readings runs monthly now through December of this year bringing you a whole bevy of poets working in a diverse range of styles from a wide range of personal backgrounds and coming to you live from all over the world. We are bringing you that light within that we think you'll want to lift your hat to, as Dickinson said. We will have the chance to hear these poets work and also to be in conversation with them about both contemporary poetry and about Dickinson's own legacy. My name is Brooke Steinhauser. I'm the program director at the Emily Dickinson Museum, and I am here with Elizabeth Bradley, our program education programs manager. Elizabeth, would you like to say hello? Hello, so pleased to be here tonight. So we at the museum want to thank you for tuning in. We're so excited about tonight's program. Since we can't hear you, um, we can't hear you applauding tonight for our poets, we hope that you will consider sharing your words of encouragement, um, affirmation, or appreciation in the chat during the reading. And if you'd like, you can start out just by, by saying hello, telling us where you're tuning in from tonight in the chat. There will also be a few minutes at the end of the program for a bit of conversation with these poets. So do feel free to participate in that by adding any questions that, that come to you over the course of the reading to the Q&A feature as we go. And the, both the chat and the Q&A are um, available to you at the bottom of your Zoom screen where you can um, click through and, and participate that way. Our full program should last just about one hour. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce our four poets this evening. I'm going to introduce them all to you at the, at the top of things, and then they're going to read um, one after the other, and then we'll have a chance for a quick chat toward the end. So we will first hear from Fred Marchant. He is the author of five books of poetry, most recently Said Not Said, published by Grey Wolf Press in 2017, which also published his collections Full Moon Boat and The Looking House. In 2002, House on Water, House in Air, a new and selected poems volume, was published by Daedalus Press in Dublin, Ireland. His first book, Tipping Point, won the 1993 Washington Prize from the Word Works. For over 30 years, he taught at Suffolk University in Boston and is now an emeritus professor of English and the founding co-director of the Suffolk University Poetry Center. He teaches writing workshops at the Coleraine Poetry Manuscript Conference, the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, the Hudson Valley Writer Center, the San Francisco Bay Area Veteran Writing Group, among others. Tonight, he's tuning in from Arlington, Massachusetts. Then we'll hear from Mervyn Taylor, a Trinidad-born poet and longtime Brooklyn resident. He's the author of seven collections of poetry, including No Back Door, Voices Carry, and most recently, Country of Warm Snow, which just came out last year in 2020. And that was a Poetry Book Society recommendation, which has been long listed for the Bocas Prize. His chapbook, News of the Living Corona Poems, was published by Broadstone Books also last year. Currently, he serves as co-editor on the advisory board of Slappering Hall Press in Hudson Valley, New York. And today he's coming from Belmont, Trinidad. Then we'll hear from Philip F. Clark. He is the author of The Carnival of Affection. Uh, Justin came out in 2017 and teaches at City College, New York, where he received his MFA in creative writing in 2016. He is, in, he is a poetry editor at the Night Heron Barks, ANU Magazine, and the Poets Grin. His poetry and writing has been published in Tiferet Journal, nominated for a 2021 Pushcart Prize, Vox Populi, Re and Ideas Journal, Lambda Literary and other publications. And he's coming to us from Queens, New York. And then finally, last but certainly not least, Jennifer Franklin will take us home. She has published two full length collections, most recently, No Small Gift from Four Way Books in 2018. 
And her third book, If Some God Shakes Your House, will be published by Four Way Books in 2023. So we will certainly all be looking forward to that. She was nominated for a Rana Jaffe Award and a Pushkar Prize. And her work has been published in American Poetry Review, Boston Review, Gettysburg Review, Guernica, The Nation, Paris Review, Paul Day on poets.org, and Prairie Schooner, among others. She teaches in the MFA program at Manhattanville College. And for the past seven years, she has taught manuscript revision at the Hudson Valley Writers Center, where she serves as program director and co-edits the Slappering Hall Press. Tonight, she's coming from New York City. So thank you again to all of you for being with us. Thank you to these wonderful poets. And I'll turn it right over to you, Fred. And you'll just need to unmute yourself. God, how often that happens, right? Um, thank you, Brooke. Thank you all for coming tonight. Those of you who have tuned in, Thank you, my fellow readers. It's such a privilege to read with you. And thank you, everyone connected with the Emily Dickinson Museum. Um, it is really a privilege. I'm going to begin right away with a poem by Emily Dickinson that many of you will know. Number 288, in case you, you want to write these things down. I'm nobody. Who are you? Are you? Nobody, too? Then there's a pair of us. Don't tell. They'd advertise, you know? How dreary to be somebody. How public, like a frog, to tell one's name. The live long June to an admiring bog. <clears throat> about 10 years ago, my wife and I went to the Emily Dickinson Museum when it was open in those days. And um, it was such a beautiful afternoon. And I sat out in the yard afterwards on the bench and started this poem. It's, uh, it's from my book, The Looking House, also Grey Wolf Press. Um, it's called Nobody Too, as in T-O-O. -O. Nobody Too. I would be small and innocuous, as harmless as the wind that lifts the grass lightly and bends the lupins, the new stems barely green. I would pause in affirmation like the squirrels in the pine, my back arching and torso rippling into a question that flees before the answer. I would teach my heart how to be a heart, help the doors open wide, invite the tall shadows to peek in like curious strangers, my chambers brimming over with them. The poem you may hear it a little bit, there are poems laden with some dashes and pauses, and of course they owe something to Emily Dickinson. And one of the great gifts of Emily Dickinson to the 21st and 20th century poetry um, is, is the beauty of the sentence that isn't complete. You know, the breaking of things, the pausing, hesitation, pondering. So the dynamic of that you know, is um, so beautiful. This is a poem called Pear Tree in Flower. Sometimes a tree will do anything you ask. You must speak to it softly, as carefully as you, I'm not kidding. Emily Dickinson lived from 1830 to 1886. And I know I've often forgotten this fact that um, a near contemporary, almost a near absolute contemporary, was the poet Gerard Manley Hopkins in Dublin. And he too loved to um, push syntax around, put it that way, or twist it a little bit, a different kind of twisting, but nonetheless, a cousin across the water. This poem is called Pinckney Street. That's a street in Boston. Pinckney Street. A view from the crest down to the river, a walk, and my friends stopping to say that for three weeks each year, 
And beginning tomorrow, this will be the most beautiful place in the city. Our respite in brick-faced buildings, blushing in sunlight, in star magnolias swelling, about to burst into bright badges, medallions of tangible life and light, all the way down to the, to the water. The shook foil that Hopkins wrote about. The minutes, the minutes we have of grandeur, hope, gratitude. <clears throat> It's a pretty new poem. It's called Gratitude. Gratitude is the subtitle. It's on the locked ward. Gratitude. The world, what little I see of it, pressed first its cheek and then its lips against my window. Thank you, I said to the world. Thank you for the bliss of night that comes to visit every day. Thank you for the trees that do not sleep and their roots that reach in under the building and seem to me to climb sometimes up the stairs, slip in under the door looking for me. Thank you, wind, for bending the trees, pulling the leaves to help me remember the long waves, the curling heave and tug of tides that pulse as predictable as mine. Thank you, temple vein. Thank you, heart and brain, for still being of this world, even if, old friends, you are no longer in it. When I look to the side, I'm looking at my clock, just so you know. <laughs> Where am I in this? Vigil. Thank you. Vigil, this is also a really new poem. Vigil. Over at last and gone, the body that, been, that was belongs now to no one. Palpable absence unequivocally arrived. The sheer lack of ambiguity in the moment takes your breath away. You feel almost grateful for what loss might be able to teach you, handing you over hostage to a regime ruled by the lords of the real. You sit and marvel at how quickly you feel keen admiration for the literal and how metaphors make you smile as they sneak into your thoughts and seem almost a calculated posture when compared to the dim warmth in the hand you still hold until you place it down gently. Thinking how gently does not matter anymore. And you note the bed rail, the proud embossed medallion. You note the fluorescent that shines upon it and the face that has begun to look like a mask. You think, you imagine, you wish that before the soul floats up and out, it would hover at the sealed window. You hope it wants to touch you once before leaving this airless room where kindness invited you in and asked you if you'd like to have a few minutes alone. Well, of course, Emily Dickinson's presence is inside all of that, you know, the, the exquisite way in which she understood the moment in which um, life passed and, and always has haunted me uh, from her words, actually. I'm going to read the first few stanzas of a longer elegy for a dear friend, a poet named Jean Valentine, who certainly owed much to, um, to Emily Dickinson, her, 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 her unbelievable ell elliptical thoughts notched on the poem. She was not an orotund poem. You know that word orotund, you know, like a bloviating politician, right? Or, so this is this elegy, it's a lighthearted elegy. It's called a rotundity. And it's for Jean Valentine. She hated the orotund poem. One of the few things she ever hated that 
and the impulse to harm. Or rotundity, much lower on the sin chart, a cousin never, nevertheless. And she did believe in sin, avec forgiveness. Right now, she'd be getting nervous at what I'm about to mention. Knock it off, she might have said, laughing. Be more by what you are not saying than what you are. Be more by what you are not saying than what you are. Um, this is also another poem to another poet who owed so much to Emily Dickinson, William Stafford. I was a great privilege of editing William Stafford's early poems for Grey Wolf Press. Another World Instead is the name of it. And I spent time in the William Stafford archives. And Stafford said more than once in writing and in person, Emily Dickinson was his most important and favorite poet. And um, so this is called Trout, a, a dream in the William Stafford archives. It's got a little bit of a prologue, which I'm going to skip. And I'm going to go right to the dream, OK? Trout, a dream in the William Stafford archives. Oh, by the way, it's in his voice. We could be like trout holding steady in the onrushing stream. And as this is where we've chosen to live, we will have to open our eyes and face what the words bring us. Be grateful for the stones beneath and what little we can see of the sky and forests above. Now that we know who we are and what we hope to do, there is no reason anymore to hurry. Poem says, in order to survive in this place, we will, learn, we will need to learn first how to breathe underwater. And I'm going to end um, on another, um, you know, kind of literary cousinhood, we'll put it that way. Henry David Thoreau lived 75 miles away from Amherst. And so we can only imagine that the spirits communicated, but they apparently never met. In looking this up in, in Wiki today and Googling it, I learned that Apple TV has a, a program called Dickinson. And apparently Thoreau and Dickinson have some kind of connection. I haven't seen it. So, um, but this is a poem set at Walden Pond at the foundation that held up his cabin way back. And there's a, people when they come there, as you, many of you know, put stones, mound, mounds of stones and cairns as a memorial next to that, next to where the cabin was. So I'll end with this. A cairn by the cabin, Walden Pond. The asphalt parking lot, our summer high thick heat and children with towels, flip flops, popsicle rockets, red, white and blue ice. How deep the hole our country did fall into while we slept, and how the dream brought us locusts, their wine, the sound of a someone strapped to the table, cut open for the hoses, the salt. Impossible to say where we stand now on a path that circles what HDT said was the eye of God, but now feels like a corner where a sparrow has fallen from its nest and is looking up at us, as bewildered as we are. While down in the mud, leafy pools, shallows, deep within alluvial history, our truths are unfolding beneath us. So we wanted to find out if there was, after all, some granite there, something we believed in that held us together. He must have known it was always tentative ready to fall apart, that we each would have to believe enough to build it over again, and that this, this is what these stones are here for. Thank you, thank you all. I'm done. <laughs> So we're going to pass it right on to Mervyn Taylor, and I'm pulling up his poems for him as we speak.
I thought I might begin with Emily's poem about grief, that she can wade grief whole pools of it. And thank you so much, Fred, for that opening. I'm just a, a little bit stunned for the moment here. So I, I, I remember teaching uh, Emily Dickinson many years ago when I was teaching at Bronx Community College. And um, these students, could, as much as they liked the poems, they could never understand why anyone would want to remain so secluded and in a room for so long doing these things. And I think that's part of the appeal, right? I mean, even if she never wrote anything, the image of her in that seclusion is what poets kind of like, you know, the, the poet at, at the desk, the poet writing, we kind of enjoy that. Uh, I remember when I was grow when a little boy, really, um, well, two stories. When Joseph Brodsky came to the islands, he came, uh, Derek Walker brought him down to Trinidad and he read here and then he went to Barbados. When he came back to New York, he said, um, he didn't understand how people could hear would want to write because the sun is shining brilliantly outside and the waves are sparkling. Why would you sit in a room writing when that is going on? It must be very difficult to do, you know. And it, it takes me back to when I was a little boy and on a Saturday morning, I'm in the house and I'm reading. I loved reading. I used to walk home from school and walk into the lamppost because I was reading my book on the way home. And my, my mother's, the neighbor, my mother's friend said, um, scolded me and she said, what are you doing in the house? It's a beautiful day out. The kids are out there playing cricket in the lane and so on. And before I could say anything, my, my mother responded to her and my mother said, is he in your house? And that was the end of that. So staying home and staying inside, you understand the image of that and the image of Emily. She wrote this one, this particular poem, I think, is the one that stays with me. I can wade grief, whole pools of it. I'm used to that. But the least push of joy breaks up my feet and I tip drunken, let no pebble smile. It was the new liquor, that was all. Power is only pain stranded through discipline till weights will hang a bomb to giants, and they'll wilt like men. Give him a lair, they'll carry him. And the second part of that poem lets you understand her belief that grief is what makes us stronger, pain is what makes us stronger, and that if we give balm to those who are suffering, it, it doesn't help, it makes them weak. And that more suffering, this is Emily's opinion, give, give, put the weight of Himalaya on men and they'll carry him. They'll carry that and they'll be stronger. I want to read then some poems that follow in, in the same vein of Emily talking about grief. And this one, it doesn't speak so much about grief, but it, uh, you'll see the reference to Emily Dickinson in here. Crude. What type of pitch do we use that our sidewalks crumble so? And when we fix them, why do they sit so high above the road that the elderly must be helped down one trembling leg after the other? Ah, these dips and rises, said one tourist, dizzy from the sun, resting in Cipriani's short shadow, shirt dark with sweat. Still, he seems happy, munching on his doubles, the wife nearby taking pictures. Tomorrow they'll visit La Brea. Their guide will explain the nature of crude, how it glazes the streets of London and Washington, but here, it makes turtlebacks of our lanes, breaks up our step as Joy does Miss Dickinson's, my poetry teacher explained. So there's just one line that refers 
that's the clue what she said about joy breaking up her stuff. So I continue in the vein of, of grief and breathing, grieving, particularly applicable to this um, pandemic time, the, the difficulty people are having in terms of expressing grief, in terms of saying goodbye to loved ones, you know. My father's last night. On his last night, candles seemed to move through the house on their own. Prayers rose like smoke in the shadows. I woke and slept and dreamed. Where was his voice among the murmurs? Where was mine? Too young, I wasn't allowed near his bed. Only women stirring the night air, his hands waiting to be still. And this is a poem I struggled with for a long time. Um, and we're continuing in the same vein about how to grieve. That was about my father and I was in the room next to his as he actually in this very room where I'm sitting now, the room next door to his uh, as he lay dying. And this one is a poem about trying, about grieving from far, far away. It's called, I couldn't afford the ticket home. The day my mother died, I was in DC in the lobby of the building where I worked the evening shift. When the switchboard blinked and I heard my uncle muffled by the Atlantic say, Go, on. Go home, said the manager. Home was near the college in a house on Water Street that smelled of chitterlings on Saturday. I don't remember how I got there. Only that after I climbed the stairs, I lay in bed, staring at the transom between the room next door and mine that someone had nailed shut. In the, in the book, um, my most recent book, the chat book actually, um, Corona Poems, News of the Living, the poem titled, How to Grieve, Instructions on how to be actually there was a picture in the uh, in the newspaper and i'm not sure if it was a local newspaper with news about africa but it talked about the people at the funeral and the behavior of the, the widow the grieving widow how to grieve death has taken on so many meanings so many bodies we stop counting so many infected, we must say goodbye from a distance. And when a woman straddles the coffin of a dear one in an attempt to love him back to life, even while condemning such a display, we must forgive as we rock and sing, abide with me, silently urging her on. I'm not sure I'm doing for time. Um, am I okay, Brooke? I hope. <laughs> okay. Love of reading. One of the things I think that Emily implied in her surreptitious way is that as much as she uh, says that pain is good and pain will strengthen and so on, she talks about the antidote, right? The, the thing that helps in terms of that grieving is to find is some love somewhere, as she does love through her poems. As much as she talks about grief and pain and so on, she talks about that which will make us survive. And even when she talks about death, as the as she calls she calls that the supple suitor, the supple suitor. In other words, it, it, it's that is like a lover who comes to take you in a carriage, you know. And and in doing that, she sort of disarms death in her way. Disarms it. Love of reading. I reach for the volume she loaned me, bending corners each time I pause. There's love in it, an action, bars where humans drink and where freedoms taken away. There's comfort when the world intrudes and a new chapter lets the hero 
come back home. The girl who first let him touch her is dying. He lifts her with the help of others out to the ambulance. It's a sadness I can afford, that of someone else's life. Ink smudged as I turn the page. I take my time because it must last till we're ready to go outside again. When she reminds me it's overdue, return it, I must, along with her love. And the closing poem, Red Sea. You sleep better, you said, nearer the ocean. But our coast is rough, winds so strong. I imagine your pillow made of foam, your head tossed like a palm, and the rest of you lying curled by morning, naked as a starfish among shells and driftwood, found by a curious boy like me. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you guys and thanks everybody who tuned in today thank you Mervyn we'll turn it right over to Philip uh, it is so glad to see everyone here wonderful to read with these wonderful colleagues thank you to all at the Emily Dickinson Museum uh, I, I, I feel her close I absolutely feel her close uh, Emily has been in my life for a long time, and I can honestly say she's the single poet with me every day in some way, and she will continue to invest my life with what she's done. I'm going to begin with a very short poem by hers um, that I, I, I loved. Emily always had a side of wit just on the edge of things, and I found this to be quite like that. I took one draft of life. I'll tell you what I paid, precisely an existence, the market price, they said. They weighed me dust by dust. They balanced film with film. They handed me my being's worth a single dram of heaven. Uh, I will now, I'll read <clears throat> some short poems from my book, The Carnival of Affection. And the book, is about affection in so many forms, desire, love, all those forms that Dickinson also reaches out to in her poetry. And as Dickinson said, speech is a symptom of affection. And I like that idea of affection as a symptom as well as speech. This is the beggar's welcome. He stopped and asked if I could spare some change. I thought, oh yes, I could spare so much. Another job, a new home, other clothes, better weather, more chances, less pain. Yes, I could spare some change. He held out his hand, calloused, sooted and cracked. I groped for my wallet and I held his eyes. Still young, if half alive, as if they and his body were not the same. There were the chances he mistook, the changes on a dime, the house, the car, the wife, or lover, the constantly put off grave. All I had was a clean last 20. Without a thought, I handed it to him. As he gently took it, his hand in mine, I knew it's all we ever want, the holding. The asking is never as hard as the needing, the accepting never as hard as the taking. I never took your body for granted. Now, as it is constantly missed, it at times appears at rest in the room, sun muscled and warm, configured by my stray illumined thoughts of how a body pleases in the dark where absence has its harbor.
This is Body Tender Thief. Body Tender Thief, you pick among us, sure in your magpie choices. Your stolen goods are skin, hair, muscle, and memory, pawned and haggled over time. Calmly in your taking, we lose a thought here, there a tooth or eye. Itinerant, industrious, you cleave first one breath, then two. Quietly, you stop the heart. You barter all desire, proud to own its end. Patient, ardent, you win. And I will <clears throat> next read a poem that also is a poem of grief. And yet I wanted to find a way to speak about that that is also something close to what grief as illumination is, as acceptance. This is called Grief Leaves the Room. It leaves on a Saturday, suddenly, while you're raking leaves or taking out the trash. Those inevitable, boring things. You do not hear it go. It's been quiet before when it left certain rooms. It no longer sleeps beside you, and you learned long ago that the bed was seldom warm. Yet the least of it was never about a missing body. You've made the bed nonetheless. Eventually, eventually you do not return its calls. And really, what letter might you write? How is the weather there? Do you have the company of others? It unclasps its hand from yours. There was no urgency in its exit. Perhaps it was just a visitor all along, there when you needed it with news of the outside world. Your body has lost its ghost, a gentle amputation. There was no pain. In its place came the mundane art of acceptance and you are able to respond to emails, listen to the opera, deal with late rent. It never had a name though you tried so many on for size. Nothing fit when you tried to wear it and you could not return a thing. You are well-dressed now, naked in your best. Tomorrow is Sunday, a day of rest. And I'm going to end with a <clears throat> poem. Emily did have such a wit in so many of her, her, her poems. And I wanted to try to catch something in that, <clears throat> in sort of a, a tribute poem to her today, which I just actually wrote um, and finished today. I borrowed the habits of the world, hoping the lenders would not object to my perusal. I was frugal with indecision. I touched and folded carefully each truth. I laid them out for choosing. I wore joy, its pediments high. I tried on responsibility, ripped in places. Desire was a cloth of the finest loom. I troubled its impertinent phosphorescence. Forgiveness was a fragile fit. <clears throat> One sleeve too short, one sleeve too long. I threaded acceptance between them. I returned each of these, not less for wear, each with a receipt of owner. But love, the overcoat, I could not give it back. Too large and heavy though it was. Larceny, larceny, I gladly wore my theft. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was wonderful to hear, especially that new poem, Philip, that you finished for, for tonight. And you can all see why I wanted to read here with these wonderful poets who really live with Dickinson every day. And um, it's my honor to read here with Fred and Mervyn and Philip. And thank you so much to Elizabeth and to Brooke for this incredible night. I will never forget it. I'm gonna start with a poem by Dickinson, one of my favorites. Um, 
It was the one that I did a report on for my seminar at Columbia for my MFA with my teacher, uh, Alice Quinn. Um, it's called um, number 508, I'm seated. I've stopped being theirs. The name they dropped upon my face with water in the country church is finished using now. And they can put it with my dolls, my childhood and the string of spools I finished threading too. Baptized before without the choice, but this time consciously of grace unto supremest name. Called to my full, the crescent dropped, existence's whole arc filled up with one small diadem. My second rank, too small the first, crowned, crowing on my father's breast, a half unconscious queen, but this time adequate, erect, with will to choose or to reject. And I choose just a crown. And I love that really fierce voice of hers saying that she's choosing her own life and her own voice. And this is the first poem in my first collection looming. Daughter, hollow as a gilded reliquary, I am everyone's receptacle of secrets. I hold each lie and confession like saints clavicles and vertebrae. Transparent, I display the treasures I am trusted to safe keep. They do not expect me to judge or offer. To them, I am flat as a fresco, unremarkable face emerging from cerulean and gold. I belong to those who underestimate me. The stars squint in the dormant sky. I continue to know everything. They do not understand. I can undo them all. Hypocrites, charlatans, hypochondriacs. Each secret is the same secret. They want me symmetrical, endorsing their desires. I am the unloved necessity. I am the quiet in a hall when the music ceases. Someday I will surprise them with opacity. I will whisper my transgressions into the wide mouths of poppies. They will be my secrets. I will frighten them with telescope, sleeping bats, all the unsealed letters and artless glances, the mirrors I have gathered. This one is called Autumnal and it's inspired by Ibsen's Master Builder, but you might feel a little ghost of Emily in here. All night, I stare at you with a sheep's black eyes let me worry your dreams until all you see is yellow and high. I'll be dark for you and dress in white to bring you back into shadows without guilt. Even my sutures speak of loss. Always autumnal, I covet your face from my hands. Listen, I know how to braid your desires like seaweed, salty, woolen, green. This poem is called In Father's House, and this one is specifically inspired by, by Dickinson's house and room. I wish we were all there right now. In Father's House, I have my own wide room with yellow walls. It is nearly always cold and kin to me. I need not chasten old soil with my footfall. One scene of this life from my window is the world. Each woman has something sharp, needling at the brain, a spying heart that wants everything. He does not see me. I am small, tremulous. In white, I am an icicle. Things do not pass through me. The birds that line my windowsill are there by invitation and return. And this one is inspired by Emily Dickinson's Master Letters. It has small phrases from the letters throughout the poem. And the title comes from a phrase in one of the letters as well. And the first time I, I read the letters was because I, I bought the, the book 
there at the Emily Dickinson Museum and still have it with the facsimiles. It's called Open Your Life Wide and Take Me In Forever. All I want is for you to come back to my unlocked door or I could live in your attic room and be no trouble. I will never be tired. Remember when I was with you, I wanted nothing and needed little money. I will never be noisy. My old dresses felt like gowns when you spoke. The rooms in the red house were crooked and leaked from a hole in the ceiling. Smoke choked me, but I was content. I want to bake bread for you or spend the day typing manuscripts until dusk descends on your garden. I will be quiet, no bother. When you want to be still, I will be. Most of the time you will forget I am there, except when I sit at your knee, listening to you shape the world into words. Nobody else will see me but you, but that is enough. I keep the letters you sent me in a wooden box. I shall not want any more. When I am alone, I hold them, how you will never hold my face. This one is tiny. Um, it's called Memento Mori's Pistachio. Thank you to Tina Kane for picking it to be on the buses in Providence in February. Memento Mori Pistachios. I never know I'm an animal more than when I shell pistachios in the kitchen after washing dishes, waiting for you to come home. I know how I must look, cracking the tight shells, popping the small green nut into my open mouth again and again. I never knew your trick to pry a stubborn shell, slit not wide enough to open. You showed me how to place half a discarded shell in this small opening like a tool. It frightens me, my new resourcefulness, my hunger, the way I wait for you, as if I will never have enough. And two more poems. This one is called Memento Mori Apple Orchard. In the gold light of early October, we climb the orchard hills, searching empty trees for apples. The dog investigates with her frantic nose. Instead of the fragrant fruit on the ground reminding me of my mother's baking, I catch the smell of decay. We do not say what we're thinking that if we leave without a single apple, it might mean what we have done to the earth cannot be undone. We see boys throw bruised apples at each other. Still children, they already know what is damaged becomes a weapon. We watch them run the worn paths. Their masks fall as they bend to collect the blemished apples and fill their empty bags. And this is the last poem. And I just want to thank everyone. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you to all my students and friends and family who are here tonight. It means a lot to me. This is called Greek Gold Exhibit. I wrote this a long time ago after seeing an exhibit at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Nothing organic remains. Wooden graves, cradle pomegranate beads, combs, earrings. You are familiar with this ritual of adorning flesh with ornaments that will outlast. Gold diadems and crowns, host two cicadas and a bee. Untouched in plastic cases, they perch on gray velvet stands. The gods the Greeks cherished now cherish us, our greedy stares and protean desires. The earth chooses to preserve what it cannot use. Open tombs reveal strewn jewels and dried fruit. You poke at cold pieces, impose desire onto corpses you cannot see. You love what you want them to have been. This is one version of the afterlife. You can no longer dwell on the dead and leave to buy replicas of bronze baubles that hung from each branch of their bodies. You smell the faint aroma of what they once parted their lips to taste. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and um, give a, a round of applause for our incredible poets this evening. 
Um, what a pleasure that was to hear you. I heard so, I mean, what a, what a wonderful National Poetry Month reading this was too, that I, I think I lost count. I was trying to keep track of all the different poets who appeared here in this Zoom sphere with us tonight. Um, incredibly special to have four poets who are so deeply steeped um, and not just in, in these, um, uh, these other poets that you mentioned, but, but specifically so in Dickinson and I, I um, Jennifer, in that last poem you shared, I was having a lot of safe in their alabaster chambers moments. I don't know if those of you out there, Dickinson fans, were hearing some of that language, diadems and arcs and crescents, beautiful, beautiful. Um, I, you know, we've got just a few minutes left in our time together. If anyone out there has a question they would just love to have answered, please do feel free to pop it in the chat. Um, we're going to kind of spend the, you know, the last um, few minutes together just hearing a little bit more from these poets. Um, you all submitted as a group to our call for proposals for this reading, um, for, the, for this series. And I would just love if you could tell us briefly what brought you all together here tonight. Jennifer. <laughs> Jennifer. Jennifer. Jen is the anchor. She's the anchor in the ark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 um and maybe ha tell us how you um all know each other a little bit. I know that um I know that Dickinson was a major sort of reason for this this particular convening. I, I first met Jennifer we when uh, more than a few years ago, she was one of the first people I ever read with at uh, the, um, the wonderful, um, oh, Jen, I'm forgetting. Cornelia that. Street Cafe, yes, uh, which is where I first <laughs> met Mervyn, too. You know, and, and I just, uh, and of course, we were connected with ne wonderful Neil Silberblatt. And I had the pleasure of meeting Fred and Mervyn for the first time through this. And so I'm mm -hmm. really thankful for that. But that's how poets connect. You never know. You know, we, we, we stitch ourselves together. But uh, yeah, it's been great. Uh, absolutely great to um, have these connections. Mervyn? Yes, sir. Well, I go. Yeah. We both have stories to tell, I'm sure. <laughs> well, it, the thing is, um, this whole Emily Dickinson foray took me back so far. Um, and it, it had to do, I can't say that it was because I found her poems and I absolutely loved them, but she was one of the poets in the textbook that was the, that you were uh, made to teach back in the days, you know, and so many stories came out of teaching this woman. I had one student at the time when somebody complained about, you know, oh, these, these poems and, and this solitude and so on. And one student told a story about um, uh, an uncle of hers whom her grandmother um, fed, kept in the, she didn't keep him in the basement, but he stayed in the basement riding a pretend motorcycle and his grandmother fed him and so on. And it seems to me that anything that could provoke that kind of response out of somebody deserves a second, second look or a second chance. And it has to do with those moments of breath in between those lines, the, the moments where somebody is brave enough to take on the challenge of, because it's the challenge that we, we don't like to admit it as poets, but it is the death challenge is the ultimate challenge, right? Uh, how do we come up with all kinds of devices to, to, to keep, keep that at a distance, right? To, to move it away, you know? Um, when we write poems to comfort our friends, we're actually writing again, putting up the armor of language against the, the dark shadow, you know? And I don't know anybody who did it as well as Emily did, you know, that constant, here I am, come and get me kind of attitude, you know, and uh, amazing. I think I'll, I'll go back to first meeting Jenny at um, some years ago at the Hudson Valley Writers Center. They, they, the Hudson Valley Writers Center typically does um, a reading involving veterans uh, in the fall around Veterans Day. And um, this many years ago, I was invited to be part of the reading uh, there. And that's how I, I think that's how I met you, Jenny. I'm not totally sure. Yes. 
And, um, and then shortly thereafter, we started talking. And, and the Hudson Valley Writers Center is in fact a really great place to think as well as write. And it's a, it's a wonderful sort of, um, you know, perched right on the river. It is a wonderful place to be. And so over the years, I've, I made it, I drave, I've driven down in the morning to teach an afternoon workshop and driven back at night. And I don't know what, what's that's in me, but somewhere in my head, there's just some, the great solitude of long distance driving. And, and then, um, so over the years, you know, we've known each other, but then the phosphorescence um, signal went out uh, from the museum and yes. Jenny saw it. And, and then broadcast, she made the decision, you folks are the folks who would be interested in reading. And so she brought in, and she really, so I really thank you, Jenny, for doing that. And I, you know, I, I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> and I'm glad you mentioned the center because there's so many people affiliated with the center here tonight. And I have to say hi to all of, Fred and I share a lot of, of the same students. And so I have to thank all of them for, for being in attendance to hear us. And, and Mervyn, of course, is one of our co-editors of the center's press, Slapper and Hall Press. And so we have that bond um, together. So it well, made sense. Je Jenny, it, it's very hard to say no to you. You know, <laughs> you, 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 just, you just make everything sound like, you know, caviar, you know, so it's, it's okay, <laughs> let's go. Yeah. I, I want to ask my, my, my colleagues a question. Brooke, you said that was an, an okay thing to do. Absolutely. I, wonder, I wonder if you folks had the same experience that I did in preparing for this, not just yesterday or today, but you know, for the last few weeks, months, that I, it, it was a discovery. Even though I knew Emily Dickinson's work was very close to my work, and I knew that, and I always longed to be more Dickinsonian, right? I, I was stunned to, when I, when I looked at it with these lenses, I said, my God, there's so much, so many things that my, somehow my unconscious had picked up, you know, and like Velcro or something, just picking things up from, from her work. And I wonder if you folks had a similar um, or different, you know, kind of experience in yeah. getting well, ready. One, one of the things that happened um, with me going through some of the poems is I, I didn't know she was such a, a, a liberal thinker. And, and there's a poem in which she, she says, we have to get rid of caste and so on. I forget the title of the poem, but she says, there's no caste. Um, there's no hero. Let's see, I think I wrote the line down somewhere here. She says, that's large democratic fingers mm. rub away the brand, you yeah. know, that, that it erases all inequalities and so on, you know, um, so, yeah. And, and this, actually, I came across these on the very day that, was it yesterday that the verdict came out? Um, yeah, so there was that, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. I can quickly say I've been posting a Dickinson a day on Facebook and going over the poems, you know, every time I posted something, I remember thinking, I never read it that way. And I think that's yeah. the great thing about Dickinson is that mm -hmm. she constantly enables you to find and to find and to find. And, and, you know, you, you, you come to think that, oh, yes, I have it, I know oh, it. Good. And suddenly it's new treasure every time. Mm. Along those lines of what Philip just said, my professor at uh, Columbia, Richard Howard, um, he said to me, we have yet to catch up with Emily Dickinson's genius. Mm. And mm. I always remember that. I think he's right. Absolutely. I, I have a quick question. Um, did she do any recorded readings? Did she ever record herself reading? Or is there any reading of her poems by, by the author existed? No, right? Oh, if, if only, Mervyn, if only. <laughs> well, <laughs> but here's my question. How do you think she would interpret all those capital letters and dashes, you know, because in reading that poem about missing my mom's funeral and being away and not be, the, the word home is actually in, in quotation marks because I wasn't really referring to this home, but the home in, in America that smelled of chitlings. And to indicate that is difficult just in the audio. You know, you can see it on the page that it's, it's bracketed, 
but how how do you think she might and you guys when you write how do you intone the things that you put on the page how do you make them audible you know somebody just put that in in the chat room that they would like to see all the poems we read today <laughs> in order to study them uh, i i would i think i think your fellow poets should respond to your question i'll just I, say that I, there's, I, there's a lot about dickinson's poetic practice that it makes you think she she kind of had a, a luxury of not having to read her work aloud, right? Because she didn't have to um, make her final word selections. She could put lots of variant word choices in the marginalia. Mm -hmm. She could um, put yeah. in dashes galore. And, and whatever we, she wanted we, to, yeah. We may yeah. never know how she would have, well, we will never know how she would have read those poems. But I'm curious to hear your responses to, those, well, to that. I want to say something about Philip's last poem, because I made a little note on the pad next to me. I wrote down Larceny, capital L, because I could hear, <laughs> I could hear it in his voice, right? Definitely capital L. Yeah. Capital L, I see. Yeah, OK. Yeah, it's tricky. Well, it suddenly becomes, the larceny becomes more larcenous or something. I mean, the, the small letter does actually diminish it. And the capital L says, wait a minute, <laughs> this is not your ordinary larceny. Mm -hmm. Dickinson's dashes and her capitalization, that was her Morse code in a way, in, in mm. such a beautiful way. And I mean, as a poet myself, uh, I sit down and we think of all kinds of ways that we'll make a poem, how, how, what kind of breath, what kind of line, where do we stop? Um, but Dickinson, there is nothing like what her poems look like on the page. There's mm. just not. You know, she had she had a graphic language as well as a, a you know, a verbalization. Yeah. yeah, remarkable. Well, I do love the dashes. I mean, I I I, I coined a phrase this morning, and I, I should have used it during the reading. I I have a I have a dash debt to Dickinson. <laughs> well, I think you know there are so many ways to be Dickinsonian in your writing, and. Um, and I think we saw a, a lot of a lot of those different ways um, represented here tonight in you know in sort of experimenting with with dashes, Mervin or capitalization, Fred or language, Jennifer. Um, it, it's um, this has just been an absolute delight. I'm realizing we are actually just over our time, so I'm I'm gonna have to call us to a close. And Elizabeth, you didn't even get to ask any questions this evening. I'm sorry about that. And um, but I know, I know that this conversation, this poetic conversation between all of you wonderful poets, and I hope between you and the museum and all of you out there listening will will continue. Um, we we certainly want to um, stay in touch and to uh, keep talking with you about your work and about Dickinson. Um, so thank you so much again to our audience for tuning in. Thank you to tonight's poet. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you. And thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, audience. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you all my friends. Yes. We'll Pleasure. come see you when the pandemic is over and you're open again. Oh, yes, yes please. Yes, please. Absolutely. And um, as a reminder, these poets do have books. I saw that somebody was requesting <laughs> that in the chat. Um, we would encourage you to head over to amherstbooks.com. I'm going to put that in the chat right now for you. That is the um, official, unofficial provider of the um, books for the phosphorescence poetry series is our local independent bookstore. But certainly if you have your own local independent bookstore, head there. But buy these books. They are um, waiting for you to dive in. Uh, we really hope that you all will join us again for more of our upcoming remote programs. In May, we're commemorating the 135th anniversary of Dickinson's death with a virtual poetry walk around Amherst, which will feature the work of 10 contemporary poets um, alongside Dickinson's own words. So that's going to be a fantastic program. And of course, we'll, we'll be bringing you the next installment of Phosphorescence, which features poets Melissa Range and Erica Cheris Malling. So to learn more about these programs, to sign up for our monthly mailing, or to make a donation, please visit us at emilydickinsonmuseum.org. Until we see you again, we wish you well. We hope you take good care of each other and of yourself. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you so much. Bye, guys. Thank you so much. Take care. Good night. Thank good night. you. Happy Poetry Month. Happy Poetry Month. Happy Poetry Month. Happy poetry month.